Hi, welcome back to Kirstie's Virtual Classroom. Today we're talking about ecosystem ecology. All right, so what exactly is ecosystem ecology? So this just examines all of the interactions between the living and the non-living worlds. So here in this image, you see rocks and trees, grass, um, fungi, bacteria, sunlight, whoop, um, a lot of different things, right? So ecosystem ecology is just a study of all of living and non-living things and their interactions. Okay, so what is an ecosystem? Ecosystem is a particular location on Earth that is distinguished by its politic particular mix of interacting the biotic, which is the living, and the abiotic, non-living components. So this is ecosystem just says that it's the interaction between living and non-living things. So what are biotic versus abiotic factors? So biotic components are animals, plants, microorganisms, bacteria, fungi, anything that is living. Okay, and then abiotic components include air, sunlight, temperature, soil, um, rocks, water, pH, all of those things that are non-living are considered the abiotic factors. And in order for an ecosystem to thrive, both of those things need to interact with each other. Okay, so in some ecosystems, such as caves, lakes, forests, um, they have very distinctive boundaries. So you can see where the ecosystem ends and another one begins. But in some, it is very difficult to distinguish between where one ecosystem ends and another one begins. And not all um, ecosystems are the same size. So here there are two extreme examples. We have a very large ecosystem, which is the Yellowstone ecosystem. Um, we have Yellowstone National Park here, and then there's all of the different animals and species within um, that ecosystem, which includes the volcano. So the volcano is part of the ecosystem, but is an abiotic factor, not a biotic factor. Um, and then over here on the left, we see a very small ecosystem um, within a tree branch where we see a little bit of water and then some fungi and microorganisms. So um, ecosystems aren't necessarily all the same size. Um, not, they're not all created equal. Okay, so energy flows through these ecosystems. And here is where we start to see the producers, the consumers, um, and then the different levels of consumers. So the primary difference between biotic factors or the living creatures are whether they are a producer or a consumer. So producers or autotrophs use the sun's energy um, to produce food through photosynthesis. So you probably learned about photosynthesis in really early biology. And then consumers or heterotrophs obtain energy by consuming other organisms. So they use something called respiration. We'll talk about that in a second. So under consumers, depending on what level they are in the food chain, they're either going to be primary, secondary, or tertiary. So if they're primary, those are the herbivores, so they eat grass, leaves, things like that. The secondary are carnivores, so they obtain their energy from eating the primary consumers. And then there's tertiary who eat the secondary consumers. So a good example here would be primary would be like the zooplankton that are eating algae, and then fish are eating zooplankton, so that makes them the secondary consumer, and then the tertiary consumer would be the bald eagle eating the fish. Okay, so it's just kind of a stepwise process. So in a food web, um, different animals in a particular ecosystem are going to have a different impact on um, the entire system, right? So depending on what they eat, they can either be producers, they might be scavengers, they might be decomposers, okay? So <clears throat> decomposers would be things like bacteria and fungi or earthworms, whereas producers would be like the grass and the trees. Those are using photosynthesis, basically everything else here um, uses respiration. Okay, so do you think an animal can be more than just a consumer? Could it be a primary and secondary, a scavenger? So this is true for a couple of different animals here. 
So the lion can be a secondary consumer and a scavenger, depending on the situation, right? So when they can't find food, sometimes they just scavenge for food and already dead animals. And then hyenas are similar as well. So they can be primary consumers, they can be secondary consumers, and they can also be scavengers. So they're a little bit more um, complicated than some of these other animals. All right, so cellular respiration is the process by which other organisms gain energy through eating tissues of producers. Remember, producers go through photosynthesis. Um, so all organisms, including producers, carry out respiration, but only producers are capable of photosynthesis. So a little bit of um, elementary biology, if you will. Um, photosynthesis, if you don't remember, is the process of taking solar energy and making that into glucose. So glucose is really important because this is what we breathe in, right? So we breathe in um, the O2 and then we exhale the CO2, which is what um, the other component in addition to water that plants will use, plants, algae, and bacteria will use to carry out photosynthesis to then create more oxygen, okay? So the oxygen is what we intake as well as the glucose and then we produce water and co2 and then the energy mostly comes from the sun so we kind of need each other so that's how the ecosystem kind of works right so producers need consumers consumers need producers um so it's kind of a balancing act right we don't want to lose our ecosystem because we chopped down a bunch of trees all right, so like I said, it kind of forms this circular pathway um, and the transfer of energy and uh, carbon between organisms. So um, we expel carbon, we use oxygen and photosynthesis. Um, plants absorb that carbon and produce the oxygen for us. All right, so looking at a food chain versus a food web, food chain you're probably more familiar with than a food web. Um, food chain is the sequence of consumption from producers through tertiary consumers. So this is kind of a stepwise process. Whereas a food web is more realistic that takes into account the complexity of nature, right? So that's like looking at the hyena and saying that he's not only a primary and a secondary consumer, but he's also a scavenger. All right, so looking at ecosy ecosystem productivity, we have two different um, components here we have the gross primary production or the GPP and the net primary production or the NPP. So the GPP is the total amount of energy that a producer in an ecosystem capture via photosynthesis over a given amount of time. Okay so a lot of this is lost to respiration it's about 60 percent and then 40 percent is actually absorbed by the producers. And then net primary production is the energy captured minus the energy res uh, respired by producers. So this is the 40% supports the growth and production of the um, producers, excuse me. So 60% of this is lost to respiration and 40% is actually supporting the growth of the producers. So energy transfer <coughs> efficiency in trophic pyramids, we have something called a biomass, which is the energy in an ecosystem is um, measured in terms of its biomass. This is kind of a technical term. And we have the standing crop, which is the amount of biomass present in an ecosystem at a particular time. Okay, so this kind of gives us an indication as to whether the ecosystem is thriving or it's at a detriment. So we have something called ecological efficiency which is the proportion of consumed energy that can be passed from one trophic level to another. And then the trophic pyramid is the representation of the distribution of biomass among the trophic levels. Okay, so in the biosphere, this is the combination of all of the ecosystems on Earth. So when I say biosphere, I'm talking about every ecosystem that exists on Earth. The biochemical cycles are the movement of matter between ecosystems involving biology, geology, and chemical processes. Okay. So matter cycles are really important because not everything, pretty much nothing, is created or destroyed. It is just recycled. So just like energy, all of these other 
matter cycles are the same way. There is nothing that is created or destroyed. So with um, Earth, we have specifically soil and rock, water, the atmosphere, and living things. So all matter cycles involve the movement of materials from one compartment to other compartments. So like water, for instance, a lot of people think that we are losing water because we're using too much of it. That's not necessarily true um, because water forms a cycle, right? So because there's more people on Earth, the water is getting trapped in people for longer amounts of time and not being recycled back into the Earth. <clears throat> Same thing with like the ocean. A lot of the ice caps, which are pure um, H2O, are melting into the ocean, which contains high levels of salt. And we cannot drink that water. So we have increase in water in our oceans, even though we're decreasing in our potable water that would be locked in ice caps right now. So here's an example of the hydrologic cycle. So this is movement of water through the biosphere. So there's transpiration, evapotranspiration, and runoff. So transpiration and evapotranspiration has to do with basically evaporating water from the ground. And that evaporated water will condense into clouds and then precipitate as rain. Um, that rainwater can then either infiltrate into the groundwater or it can run off. All right, biochemical cycles are the movement of matter within, excuse me, and between ecosystems. So this is like the carbon cycle, the nitrogen cycle, phosphorus cycle. So all of these different chemicals um, that are within our biosphere are in these biochemical cycles. So the carbon cycle is an example of one. So here you see things like human fossil fuel supply, um, human and natural caused fires, um, combustion, uh, all of that stuff will put more atmospheric CO2 into the atmosphere, but then that can be reused, like for instance by um, producers can absorb that extra CO2 and produce more oxygen. Now, if we don't have an excess amount of um, plants and trees, it's not necessarily going to help us very much there. Um, so that CO2 will then end up trapped um, until there is some exchange maybe with the ocean um, or more photosynthesis carries out. Then we have the nitrogen cycle, which is the cycle of nitrogen. Um, this can be from atmosphere. So most of our, about 70% of our atmosphere is nitrogen. Um, and that can be um, exchanged with bacteria, fertilizers. Um, and then one of the really big issues with nitrogen is it can leach from um, animals. So on farms and things like that, um, they have high nitrogen issues. And if that um, gets into the soil and leaches into our water, um, that can cause something called blue baby syndrome and it produces nitrate. Nitrates are what causes the blue baby syndrome. So um, you get a lot of babies with issues in their lungs. That's what the blue baby syndrome comes from. Um, so you don't want nitrates in your water from this nitrogen cycle, um, but it is a natural cycle um, that does occur on Earth. Then we have the phosphorus cycle. Um, and this a lot of times comes from weathered rocks. So we have phosphates in the rocks and when they weather, they will release that phosphate, which will then come into the environment. Um, and then it starts kind of in a cycle and um, it can go into the ocean. We can see uh, excretion and decomposition of plants, algae and animals um, that will produce dissolved phosphates. Um, we will see it from fertilizers, again, more leaching from animal waste, um, and then your wastewater flow will also contain phosphorus. All right, so ecosystems do respond to disturbance. So disturbance is any event caused by physical, chemical, or biological agents that results in changes in population size or community composition. Okay, so the examples of this would be like natural ecosystem disturbances like hurricanes, ice storms, tsunamis, volcanic eruptions, and forest fires. 
all of those things will cause um, ecosystem disturbances and they are all natural processes. Then we have things that are not as natural, which we call anthropogenic ecosystem disturbances. These are human settlements, agriculture, air and water pollution, clear cutting of forests, as well as strip mining. So the goal here is for us to produce the least amount of anthropogenic ecosystem disturbances. We don't want to overly disturb ecosystems, right? So you see a lot of people try to do um, ecosystem restorations and things like that. Um, that is because we have disturbed ecosystems so greatly that we now need to fix it. All right, so what is a watershed? So when we study watersheds, um, these are the land given um, in a given landscape that drains into a particular stream, river, lake, or wetland. So here is an example of a watershed where there are several different drainages off these mountain mountaintops, and it looks like they all pretty much feed into this main river. Resistance versus resilience. So these are important terms when we're talking about restoring um, restoration ecology. So resistance is a measure of how much a disturbance can affect the flow of energy and matter, and resilience is the rate at which an ecosystem returns to its original state after a disturbance. So resilience is kind of its own way of restoring itself, um, and resistance is its um, basically its resistance <laughs> to um, any disru disruption. So instead of letting it entirely disrupt the ecosystem, it does have some resistance to that disruption. So restoration ecology is some new, uh, a new scientific discipline that is focused on restoring damaged ecosystems. So it falls under um, kind of these environmental scientists and environmentalists. So the intermediate disturbance hypothesis states that the ecosystems experiencing intermediate levels of disturbance are more diverse than those that have high or low levels of disturbance. So this is kind of interesting because <clears throat> with disturbance, um, sometimes it can be negative because if you have such a high disturbance in an area, it can completely wipe out an ecosystem. But with just the right amount of disturbance, you can basically push evolution to its max, right? Because with some level of disturbance, things have to adjust. The ecosystem has to um, change just slightly in order to accommodate that disturbance. Um, so you do see a lot of growth in ecosystems that have intermediate disturbance. So when we look at different values of ecosystems, they can either have instrumental, or they, the, basically the value is as a tool, or intrinsic. So ecosystems and species that have instrumental value um, are providing ecosystem services. These can be quantified, okay? Ecosystems and species can also have intrinsic value, that is value independent of any benefit occurring to humans. These cannot be quantified. Okay, so instrumental versus intrinsic. So under that, we have provisions, regulating services, and supporting systems. So provisions will be goods that humans can use directly. So these would be things like crops. Um, regulating services, the service provided by natural system that helps regulate environmental conditions. So this would be like our regulatory agencies. And then support systems, this is, oh, sorry, the support services that natural ecosystem provides such as pollination, natural filters, and pest control. All right, so we talked a little bit about resilience of an ecosystem, but it ensures that it will continue to provide benefits to humans. Um, this greatly depends on species diversity. And then we have culture, cultural services. Ecosystems provide cultural or aesthetic benefits to many people. So that's kind of why a lot of these uh, public lands have been preserved was for their cultural or aesthetic benefit. Um, and then some are um, for maybe a watershed purpose. So because it is a natural watershed that provides a lot of water, there is it's a, under a protected land, um, but a lot of them have, fall under this cultural services. <clears throat> 
So many people believe ecosystems and species have more than just a utilitarian value for humans. So these include both philosophical and religious value that is placed upon life. Um, this is true in somebody named Dr. Albert Schwitzer, um, his moral idea of reverence for life. So this belief that people have a moral responsibility to preserve ecosystems. So this kind of gets into an environmentalist, kind of environmental science heavy topic that we need to preserve ecosystems um, and allow some natural disturbance to them to promote evolution, but we don't necessarily want to completely disturb them with our human activities because that will then wipe out their ecosystem and completely alter um, the different biomes on Earth. All right, and that's it for Ecosystem Ecology. I'll catch you guys in the next one. Bye.